And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you'll take your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. As you're turning there, I want to remind all men that tonight is a men's event. It is an evangelistic event. I encourage you men to be back at five o'clock this afternoon and bring other men and uh, with you to hear the message and have great fellowship and food this evening. The title of the message today is The Trinitarian Blessings of the Saved. Now, Trinitarian's a big word. What that means is the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, the Trinity. One God, three persons, the Trinitarian blessings that we who are saved enjoy. And the Apostle Paul presents these in verses 4 through 14. And so we'll be looking at verses 3 through 14 in just a moment. According to Ephesians 1.1, the Apostle Paul is led to write to the church in Ephesus, to the saints there, to the Christians that are gathering to worship him together in that city. And so you need to realize as we study the text today, who the audience is, who are the original recipients of this letter and of the text we study today. And it is born again Christians in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the saved. He is writing to the saved about the blessings they enjoy from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. If you'll join me in standing for the reading of God's Word, again, I'll be reading verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Lord God, we thank you for your word and the truth of it. And I pray, God, that you would guide my lips to speak your truth to clearly articulate the teaching of this text of Scripture. I pray you would give understanding to the listener. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would rend the heavens and come down in power and meet with us and help every Christian here today delight that they have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And I pray for those that do not know you, Lord, that today would be the day when they believe. Today would be the day when they're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Today would be the day when they're adopted into your family by placing their faith in you. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. 
For those that were not here last Sunday, for those visiting with us, I want to let you know we're going verse by verse through this sixth chapter book called Ephesians. And so we started last week with the first two verses and an overview of the book, seeing the contents, uh, from, contents from all six of the chapters. Today we dive in to verses 3 through 14. I want to let everyone know, those that have been here many times and those here for the first time, the Bible says there are some things in the Bible that's like baby food, it's like milk. And then there are some things in the Bible that's solid food. Let me tell you, this is solid of solid today, okay? This is as complicated as you can get, I would say, in Scripture. There are some other complicated things in Scripture, obviously, but this is one of them. This is an area where Christians that love the Lord have disagreement. And so I'm going to do my very best to articulate from the Scriptures today what God is saying through these verses. Here's what I ask of you. What I say in the first 10 minutes, please listen to it, but don't draw all your conclusions because what I say in the last 10 minutes is in conjunction with the beginning. It's all one unit. In the Greek, all these verses are one sentence. And what God is telling us through that is, what I say in verse 4 and 5 is in conjunction and agreement with what I say in verse 13 and 14. It's all one sentence in the Greek. In the English, it's multiple sentences, but in the Greek that it's translated from, it is one sentence because what God the Father does and what God the Son does and what God the Spirit does is all in unity with one another. So what I'm trying to say is this is a message where you can take me out of context if you just take a 20-second sound bite. And so get the whole message here. In this message, you're going to see me talk about outside of time and inside time. What in the world does that mean? Well, there are verses of Scripture that speak of what God does outside of time. In Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God was at work before that, if you don't know. He didn't start then. The world began then. His creation began then. God's always been, and God was at work before that. And we're going to address that today. That's God outside of time. See, God is not bound by time. All right, so let me just start off by blowing our heads up here. God doesn't need to time travel because he's at all time in the present at all times. So if we journeyed back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and we time traveled back then, God is there right now in the present. If we journeyed ahead to the new heaven coming down and the new heaven and the new Jerusalem, God is right there right now in the present, though it's future to us. God is not bound by past, present, and future like us. He's outside of time. He's also outside of space. God can exist without taking up space. I can't. I take up space. And I live in time. It will never be yesterday again. Time is passing. We are bound by time. We are bound by space. God is not. So what's amazing about Ephesians 1 is it talks about God outside of time for a few verses. Then it talks about what God does in time for a few verses. Then it talks about man's response to God for a few verses. We find all three in one text of Scripture, which is quite rare. And that's what makes this glorious and wonderful. So here we go. Now I need to journey into the text here and give you examples here of starting with God outside of time. Number one, the will of the Father. The will of the Father. Verse 3 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? Every, this has already happened, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Child of God, there's no more, there are not additional spiritual blessings God can bless you with. He's already blessed you with all of them. Woo! He's already blessed you with all of them. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, beginning in verse 4, he begins to spell out what a lot of those blessings are. So here we go. Everybody got their seatbelts on? Here we go. Number one, 
He, the Father, talking about what the God the Father has done, he, the will of the Father, He, the Father, has chosen. And He has chosen when? Verse 4 tells us, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now, you might have trouble comprehending it as I struggle with comprehending some of these things. But it is very clear what verse says. It's not complicated. He chose us. When did he do it? Before the foundation of the world. This is called election. All right? So a seminary professor once said this, try to explain election and you will lose your mind. Try to explain it away and you may lose your soul. All right? It is in the Bible. And so we need to do our best to understand it. Now, as I talk about election... If you start thinking, but what about when we believe? What about repentance and faith on the part of us when we turn from our sin and place our faith? If you go there, you are missing the point of verses 4 through 6. Verses 4 through 6 have nothing to do with us. In fact, verses 4 through 6 occurred before Adam and Eve sinned. All right? It's, it's God the Father and what He did in eternity past, outside of time in space. Election is God's doing. Now, let me let you in on some things here. We believe that God has demonstrated election in different forms throughout the Bible. God elected Abraham, told him to relocate, that he would become a father of a great nation, that he would be the father of the nations as well. Who gives God the right to do that? God. We don't get upset that God chose Abraham. We delight in it. We teach it. He's the one that was chosen to fulfill that role. It was the stuttering Moses chosen by God to go before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. He was the one that was chosen to be the leader. Later on, Miriam and Aaron kind of said, wait a second, you think God speaks to you different than us? And she got leprosy for it because God said, yeah, I do speak to him different than you. I chose him. And so that's election where God can do what he wants and he chose Moses to be the leader. He chose Israel, a small people group, to be his chosen people group. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Hebrew. I'm not of the nation of Israel. But I don't get offended that he has a people called the Jews. All right? He chose them. He has the right to do so. He's God. He chose Jeremiah. You read in Jeremiah chapter 1, he chose Jeremiah to be a prophet before he was even born. Who gave him the right to do that? He's God. He has the right to do as he sees fit. Now, here in Ephesians 1, it says he chose us. He elected us in him, in Christ. When did he do it? Before the foundation of the world. Now, here's what it says in the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which is the summary statement of what Southern Baptists believe. And here's what it says. It's on the screen for you. Election is the gracious purpose of God, according to which he regenerates justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. It is consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It is the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness and is infinitely wise, holy, and unchangeable. It excludes boasting and promotes humility and Quote, that is a summary of we as Southern Baptists believe the Bible teaches on election. Now, we've addressed that God chose us and when before the foundation of the world, but what did he choose us to? It says in verse 4, second part, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Child of God, believer in Jesus Christ, one that's been born again, Jesus didn't just die for you, and God the Father didn't just choose you before the foundation of the world for you to do whatever you want. He chose you to be holy. He set you apart to be holy, to be blameless, to represent him to a lost and dying world. That's just the first 
of the many blessings that God's blessed us with. Second, he, God the Father, has predestined. Oh, goodness, now another big word, right? Verse 4, second part. At the, well, at the very end and then verse 5, it says, In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. So again, this is a work of God the Father to those who are saved. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. Paul and the Christians in Ephesus have this in agreement. Paul and us today who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ have this in agreement. We are believers in Jesus Christ. We have been blessed that he has chosen us from the foundation of the world. We're blessed that he's predestined us to adoption as his children. So what does predestination speak to? It speaks to determining beforehand. Determining beforehand. Destining something to happen beforehand. And so some have taught that you can't believe in predestination. You can't believe in predestination and believe that people have the freedom to repent and believe of their own accord. You are combining two different doctrines and you're combining something that happens outside of time and space with something that happens in time and space. You're combining something that God does with what man's response to God is. And if you do that, you will stay confused the rest of your days. The, The text here, when he says he predestined, it's not saying God asked us about it. He didn't do it after Adam and Eve sinned. He didn't do it after the cross. He did it before Genesis 1-1. Now, that might blow your mind. You can't put it all together. Like I said, man, this is tough to chew on. All right? This is like well-done steak. This is solid of solid. But it, it says it. And it means it. All right? So, for those that struggle with predestination, let me help you by saying that God is all-knowing. Can we agree on that? God knows all. So let's start there. And I think this will help you. Let's walk through this process. Psalm 139, verse 1 through 4, and it'll be on the screen for you. You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Now, let's digest that. If God knows everything, then nothing has ever occurred to him. He doesn't sit back and say, huh, I didn't think about that. Because he knew what happened is what would happen. He's all-knowing. He didn't ever sit around and say, oh, I didn't didn't see that they were going to make that decision. I didn't see that they would choose that. No, 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 no. He knows it all. So, if you know every detail that's going to happen, from your perspective, it's all determined. It is all destined to be that way. Because if anything turns out down the road different than what God knows will turn out, then he's not all-knowing. And he's not God. And therefore, we can't trust God's word. Notice what Psalm 139 said, if we can put that back on the screen. You, he, you know when I sit down, when I rise up. But you, you know all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, even before I speak, God, you know what I'm going to say. And so he knows the future perfectly. And when you know, just by, just by default of being all-knowing from God's perspective, everything is destined. Everything is predestined. There is nothing that will turn out any differently than what he knows. So if you're struggling with predestination, please realize you believe in it. Because you believe that he knows everything. And if he knows everything, it's going to happen that way. If you understand, if you'll say Amen. Oh, wonderful. (laughs) Wonderful. Tomorrow, I don't know where I'm going to eat lunch. But let's just say I head out. And I'm, I'm, man, I'm really looking forward to some Chick-fil-A. But I drive by and I see the fence up. Oh, dear, I forgot it's closed today. 
And I change my mind and I drive over to Tops and I get in line at Tops for some barbecue. And as I'm waiting, you know, I don't want barbecue, I want chicken. And so therefore, just because Chick-fil-A is closed, I'll just go to another chicken place. I go over to Zaxby's and I buy lunch at Zaxby's. Now, do you think God said, oh man, I didn't really know he did it, but Zaxby's. No, he know, he knew I would head to Chick-fil-A. He knew I'd go to Topps. He knew I'd go to Zaxby's. He know it's set in stone. I am freely choosing where I go, and all I do is exactly what's predestined. Amen. It's a matter of perspective. I don't surprise God by changing my mind. And so here in the text, we see that well, let me, before I get back to the test, let me give you another example. Let me give you a biblical one of predestination that you believe in. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Amen. How do you know? It's been prophesied, right? What is a prophecy? Telling you the future beforehand. Telling you what's destined to happen beforehand. We read in the Old Testament, the Messiah's coming the first time, he's going to be born of a virgin. Why? Because it's predestined he would be born of a virgin. Once he was prophesied, he was declared it's going to happen that way. God's always known it's going to happen that way. Amen. How do we know Jesus is coming back? Because it's been prophesied, which is revealing what's predestined to take place. Jesus is coming again, and when he comes, he's not going to lose. He's going to win against his foes. He's going to reign here on this earth as he does in heaven. How do we know? See, if you don't believe in predestination, it might turn out different than that. You believe it because it's been predestined, because it's been prophesied, which is basically saying the same thing. The future's been revealed to us. The new heaven and the new earth that's going to happen, it's sure to take place. It's predetermined, it's foreordained, it's predestined that one day the believers will walk the streets of gold in the new heaven. Because there's nothing that can mess it up. We all might not like the word, some might not like the word predestination, but we all believe in it without thinking about it. Because every prophecy that you believe will be fulfilled is believing that it's predestined to happen that way. And here in the text, in Ephesians 1, he says this, he predestined us to adoption. Jesus is God's son. He doesn't need to be adopted into the family. He's the exact representation of the father, the radiance of the father's glory. He is this, so to speak, the exact DNA of God the father. He's already in the family. The rest of us were not born into the family of God. When someone goes on television and says we're all children of God, biblically, no, we are not. We're all creation of God. But to be a child of God, you must repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus. You have been adopted into the family. And here in verse 5, we read that God the Father predestined us to be adopted. Now, notice uh, verse 5, second part. He preplanned our adoption. It says, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Our God is good. Our God is gracious. Our God has pre-planned our adoption. Here's what this is telling me, and here's what's true of you, believer. God didn't start just thinking about you when you repented and believed. He was thinking about you before Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. He was thinking about you in eternity past. You think you're, you're, a, you're a, by chance saved? No, you've been the plan of God. Do you realize how special you are? You're the plan of holy God. He had your, he's had, before you were for him, he was for you. He's had you on his mind from eternity past. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world and predestined us to adoption as his sons according to the kind intention of his will. Let's move now to number two, the work of the son. So now we travel 
from God outside of time in eternity past and what God the Father did then to God the Son in time dying for us on the cross about 2,000 years ago. First, we see he has redeemed. In verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. This is how we know, through his blood is how we know it's not speaking of God the Father anymore. Because God the Father didn't shed his blood, did he? It was God the Son, so it's now changed which person of the Trinity it's speaking of. It also has changed the time in which it took place. Jesus didn't shed his blood in eternity past. He shed his blood on the cross almost 2,000 years ago. The word for redemption here is apolytrosis in the Greek, and it means to set one free after purchasing that item or that person. Jesus purchased us, believers, and set us free. Please hear me, if you're here today and never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Bible describes you as chained up in bondage. It's not the Christian that's bound, it's the non-Christian that's bound. The Christian is set free from the bondage of sin and slavery. And so here we see that Jesus redeemed us. During this time of the first century, there were tens of millions of slaves throughout the Roman Empire. And a person could come along and simply purchase a one-year-old child or a four-year-old child or sometimes even adults as slaves. They, could, they just swapped them like they were swapping furniture. Jesus came along and purchased you and set you free from being a slave, made you his child, adopted you into his family. Our God is a good God. Second, he has forgiven. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Without the cross, there would be no forgiveness. Forgiveness follows redemption. Forgiveness follows the payment for sin by the shedding of blood of the unblemished lamb. But because Jesus paid the price and bore our sins in his body upon the cross, we now have forgiveness of our trespasses. You know what I love about calculators? Is you can add up about 10 numbers and hit the wrong button. It's all gone. One, one wrong button and all that time spent adding them up is gone. And that's kind of irritating, but when it comes to Jesus wiping away my sin as if it, just erasing it, removing it as far as the east is from the west, oh, I delight in that. Amen. Through redemption, he's provided forgiveness. Now, where did this come from? Verse 7, second part. According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. If you are going through mental fatigue right now, take a deep breath. He shed his blood for you and me. He's provided forgiveness of sin. He did it according to his kindness, his goodness. He has lavished Lavished means to pour out without holding back. He has lavished his grace on you. I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I'm like, what have I been complaining about in life when I've got God's grace lavished on me? You obviously, and I obviously, when we get busy complaining or griping, we're on the world and we're forgetting what God has already done for us. Amen. He has lavished his grace upon us. Oh, believer, realize your position in Jesus. Realize what the Lord has done. Realize what the Father's done and what the Son has done. Third, he has revealed his will. Look in verses 8 through 10. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will. Now, notice who he made it known to. Paul saying to him and to the Ephesian Christians. Christians, we know about the mystery of his will. Non-Christians don't. He made, he made the mystery of his will known to us who he has saved. 
And then he says, according to the kind intention which he purposed in him, verse 10, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and things on the earth. So the word mystery there is not speaking of something eerie. It's revealing what was previously unknown, what was previously hidden. But through Christ, it's been made known the full and free gift of eternal salvation with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the understanding of the church that is the bride of Christ. Christ has revealed that to us who believe. And the non-Christian does not understand it. Fourth, he has provided an inheritance. Verse 10, second part or very end of the verse, it says, in him. Verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. When Greeks would speak of something that was certain to happen, they would state it as if it had already occurred. The Christian's inheritance is like that. Notice the way it's worded. We have obtained an inheritance. Your inheritance is spoken of in the past tense, believer. Now, why is that a big deal? Because in time, as we see it, we haven't received the inheritance yet. We've received salvation, but we haven't received all that's included in the inheritance. But from God's perspective, you already have. Amen. Now, if that doesn't speak of eternal security, I don't know what does. He has already provided the inheritance, and he speaks of it in the past tense. Now, we've talked about the will of the Father from outside of time. We've talked about the work of the Son in time. And now, number three, the seal of the Spirit. So now we jump ahead in time from the death of Jesus to when you believed on the Lord Jesus. So you have what God did, he chose and he predestined in eternity past. God the Son redeemed and forgave and provided the inheritance in time. And now we jump ahead to the time when you repented and believed onto the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So what are the prerequisites to being sealed by the Holy Spirit of God? It says it right there in verse 13. One must listen and hear the message of truth. What is the message of truth? Specifically, the gospel of salvation. Paul writes the same thing when he writes to the church in Rome. In Romans 10, 14, he says, How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? We must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to believe. So first, we hear it, then we believe it. And that's right here in Ephesians 1, 13. So when you believed onto the Lord Jesus Christ, you believed that he is God who bore your sins in his body on the cross. You believe on the third day he rose from the dead. When you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed, like with a signet ring. It can't be removed. It's the signet ring of the Holy Spirit of God. This one belongs to us. When you believed, you were sealed. It's done. It's finished. That's what that seal speaks to, a finished transaction. Saving you, all the work going into that. Father, Son, and Spirit, all the work going into that. The death, the burial, the resurrection, all the work going into that. The drawing, the convicting, the saving, all the work going into that to regenerate your soul, to save you, is finished, and you are sealed. You are his. This speaks of security. It's a finished transaction that speaks of security. Who you belong to. 
I'm here to tell you, there's nothing this world has to offer that matches these riches from the heavenly places. And we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God the Father, He chose us from the foundation of the world. God the Son redeemed us on the cross 2,000 years ago. God the Spirit sealed us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. These three actions occurred at three different times from we who are not outside of time. We look at past, present, future, and all these three events occurred at three different times, and the triune God, the Father, Son, and Spirit are all involved. You need to realize when you were forgiven, that's not when you were chosen. You were chosen long before you were forgiven. You were chosen before the foundation of the world, but you were forgiven when Jesus died on the cross and you believed. You were sealed, not from the foundation of the world. You were sealed when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. These things occurred at different times, but here's the truth of the matter. Here's what Paul, inspired of God, is telling the Ephesian believers, and here's what God wants you and I to get from this text today. I love you, and you've been on my mind for all eternity. You're not saved by accident. You're part of a bigger plan, my perfect plan. You're mine. So believer, leave here today realizing how rich you are in the Lord. He has lavished his grace upon you. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, verse 13, to close. After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. No one is sealed without believing. The transaction's not finished unless you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. As God the Spirit convicts you today, as God shows you that you are a sinner in need of His grace, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need His grace. Will you turn from your sin and place your faith in Jesus? Become a believer in Jesus and be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, it means you surrender to Him that He is Lord over your life. He's boss. He's master. He's king. You do not live for self. You are not the ruler of your own life. You submit and surrender to His rule over you. You confess Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that He rose from the dead on the third day. You shall be saved from your sin that's leading you to hell. And instead of going to hell, you will be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and you'll spend eternity enjoying the spiritual blessings that come from the heavenly places. You'll spend the rest of your eternity with God's grace lavished on you. Would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Believe on Him and you shall be saved. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Right where you're sitting, you can call on the name of the Lord. You can confess Jesus as your Lord. You can just simply, God, I'm a sinner. I do not deserve your grace. I deserve your judgment. I deserve an eternity in hell. Because I've sinned against you, God. But I now confess you as my Lord. I surrender to you and I believe in my heart that yes, Jesus, you conquered the grave. You rose on the third day from death. I believe. Save me, Lord. And on the authority of God's word, if that's your heart, if you're expressing that to the Lord, confessing him as Lord and believing in his resurrection, you shall be saved. And all that I preach today will become true of you. It will be applied to you. The blood Jesus spilt will be applied to you. Forgiveness will be applied to you. You'll receive your inheritance. You'll be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Holy Spirit, draw the lost unto yourself and save their souls. This is our prayer, and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.